Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this morning's study. A little bit delayed just because computer problems are still ongoing here. But uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all that you do in our lives. And we give our lives to you. We ask for your care and protection that you can help us as we seek to follow you. And as we uh, seek to know the truth, we ask, Lord, that you can, through your grace, allow us to see our sin and our need of you, and that we can confess and forsake our sins. We know, Lord, that uh, Satan would sift us as wheat, um, but we know, Lord, that um, uh, you have a work to do in our lives, and so we submit our lives to you, to your care. We ask for your angels' uh, protection of our homes families and we ask lord that you can be in this study that you can give us a clear understanding of your word and we pray and ask it in jesus name well good morning again everyone so yesterday just at the end of the study we were addressing um as we were through most of the study uh daniel chapter 11 verse 14 and in daniel chapter 11 14 um just when we were finishing the study there, I was focusing upon this phrase, which we have um, the Strong's numbers for, and that is, and in those times. Now, um, so when we look at the Strong's numbers, we have these, uh, uh, we've been using them as symbols of days, right? Sometimes, months, sometimes hours, other things that they can be used as, but we use them as spans of time. And it seems kind of odd that we can do that, but uh, it's been witnessed to in many different ways. And so we're accepting uh, that this is something that God has been doing. It's in his providence. It gives us light for our feet here at the present time. Uh, wouldn't have been something that uh, would have been relevant in other contexts, uh, but in our time it is in regard to this movement and these lines. So when we look at the Hebrew numbers there and in those times, uh, the Hebrew number for and in those um, is, and, and we think, well, okay, you know, how come there's in the Hebrew there's one uh, word, but it has those three words, and that's because in the Hebrew, there's going to be a vav at the beginning of the word, and and the word is the word ham. Um, and uh, so that word, uh, they're actually going to have the word times first, right? So it's going to be va ba atim, atim. Uh, so that word there that's translated as as times, we know it's the number six two five six. Um, it's the, the Hebrew word itself is et. No, I'm um, sharing the calendar. Yes, I'm sharing the calendar. Okay, not sharing the Hebrew here. Um, just talking about. It. So you can you can see the calendar, right? Right. Yeah, everybody can see the calendar there in front of you. That's what we're looking at. We're going to look at some stuff here on the calendar. So so we have this uh, et, but you know, if you look at the word in Hebrew, it's va ba'atim. So et is pluralized, atim, and it's got a ba in front of it in times, and then it has a vav at the beginning. Vav just means and. So and in times, and then it has this word ha tam. Ha. Um, now, you can, if you look at here, I'm going to share the different screen so you can see what I'm looking at. It might help. Okay, so here I'm looking at the Hebrew, right? So it doesn't really help you much, but you can see in Daniel 11, verse 14, you can see it says 6256. Now, this word became significant because we recognize 6 times 2 times 5 times 6 is 360, and it's dealing with the word times, right? And and the word times, of course, is, is a symbol, you know, for time, right? So it's the word time or times. Here it's pluralized. 
a team and then it has um, you know, read from right to left. So you see that straight line, that's a VAV. And then that sort of flat line with this sort of uh, hook, whatever you would call that, that's a, a bet, right? So there's your bet. And then there's an ein, a tet, a yod, and a mem, or tav, pardon me, tav. A tav, a yod, and a mem, right? So you got these words, it's va, ba, a, ting, okay? But the word is et, okay? So that's why you have all of these different words uh, well, from one, the one Hebrew word, because it's, there's things added to it and in times. And then you have this haham after it. So you can see there's the, these both these first two letters on the right. Those are he, that's an H sound. And then that little squarish looking thing, that's a mem, that's an M sound. So haham, it doesn't show the vowel pointings here in this one. And that's 1992. So if I add those together, if I'm going to add uh, 1992 and 6256, what number do I get? Okay, we're going to get 8248. Now, 8248 is, if we take it as days, is 22 years and 212 days, I believe, if I remember correctly from yesterday. So I take that number 8248 and I divide it by... 365 and a quarter, I get 22 with the decimal point. I multiply that by 365.25 and I get 212.5. So it's either 212 or 213 days. So it's 22 years and that long. Now, in our history, when we have spans of time, 22, things like that, we usually attach them to one of our primary dates, either uh November 9th, 1989, or September 11th. Sometimes we've even gone back to, uh, in the lines of, of the kings of Persia, we went all the way back to uh, February 15th, 1979, and we found that we could use uh, a phrase, and it would give us this full span of time up to, uh, I think it was to December 23rd, 2024. So, so what I did is I just took this span of time, and I put it in the calculator, so the calendar converter. So I'll share that. And <clears throat> so here we have the date for today, December 13th, 2023. But I'm going to go back to 2001, to September 11th, 2001. Now, normally when we put a, a number in, it, it can be a span of time that is, um, uh, you know, uh, an inclusive count. So that sometimes we count uh, the, the, the whole day from that we start on, September 11th, and we include the day that we end on. Sometimes we just do a straight cardinal count, right? So if we're going to count one day from September 11th, we just, the cardinal count would be September 12th. If we did an ordinal, it would just be the same day. It would be just September 11th, right? So there are times that we do these different uh, sort of ways of counting. So if I just do a cardinal count, so when I have this adjust thing here and I get 8 to, what was it? 8248, I think it was. Let me see if that's right. Yes. That's going to bring us to April 11th, 2024. But notice it's one day past Nissan 1. So we know that the first day of the first month is a symbol. And so if I had done an ordinal count, April 10th would be uh, the 41,040 or 42,048th day. Not 42, 4, 4, 4,248th day. So I can take that number, which is in, and in these times and count from September 11th and I get to Nissan one in 2024 coming up. Would that be significant in the context of what we are studying that I get this first day of the first month in 2024 by counting this span of time and in these times? I would think that it would have some kind of significance. Okay, 
Yeah. So based on what we have done in the past, we would say, hmm, that's significant. It, it's not some random date. It is one of the main dates. September 11th is a symbol of the first day of the first month, as is November 9th, depending on, on where we are. So September 11th as the arrival of the second angel. April 19th, 1844, which is the first day of the first month, September 11th represents it. And if I take, and in these times, that phrase from Daniel 11, 14, and I use it as days and I do an inclusive count, it brings me to the first day of the first month in 2024. It brings us to the time in which we are in presently, right? And that time that we are in is what we have been studying in relation to the application of that history of the past and how it reflects at the present. Okay, so so we we can look at this. We can see it gives us the symbol of the first day of the first month. Now, this is going to be six years to the day based on the biblical calendar to the first day of the first month in 2030. Right. Um, now, we also see some other symbols here. So if we, we look at this in the Mayan date, for instance, the last two digits on the right side are eight and eight. And. Eight and eight, well, eight's the symbol already, and double the eights, that brings us to to um, Second Chronicles 29, the cleansing of the temple in the time of Hezekiah, where they're going to have the Passover in the second month, and so, a symbol that Jeff has pointed to many times, right? So we have that. So we have that symbol, and I'm just looking at this other one. There's anything the Egyptian. Nothing really there. So now we would have to then say, how do we understand this in the context of in the context of this verse? So I go there. Okay. So in the context of this verse, Daniel chapter eleven, verse fourteen, and in those times. So we're saying that that Hebrew phrase, and in those times, is going to be connecting. September 11th to this first day of the first month that's coming up in 2024, April 10th. Um, there shall many stand up against the king of the south, and also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So who is the king of the south in our time, in the way that we're making this application to our time? Wokeism. Okay, so... Yeah, so we can say it's wokeism, we can say it's atheistic communism, neo-Marxism, um, we could say it's the globalists, um, we, we could attach it to the Democrats, you know, the, the, you know, the extreme left of the Democrats, but all kinds of different ways in which we can label it. And in the context of what we had studied in these battles of the kings of the north and the kings of the south, that we related this to battles with a civil war within the United States, right? And so we looked at all these other civil wars and we saw that it gave, it connected to our history and it gave light to our history that what we're presently experiencing, that we can make an application of all of these battles to this time right now. It's not the application that is, it's not the primary application of this. Um, the primary application would be the history itself that was fulfilled in the past. But in making an application to our time in that history is going to be repeated, it's still not the primary application in our time. We believe that what we are experiencing is typical of what's going to happen. So we don't think that our line is the actual line of the Sunday law. It is a typical line of the Sunday law. It's something that's internal within this movement. And so this has meaning to us at this time. This wouldn't be a message that we give to other people and say, you know, here's in these times, it refers to this, you know, because we're not making, we're not giving a message to the world about this. We're giving a message to the movement and to ourselves so that we can understand where we are in the scheme of things so that we can understand what July 18, 2020 meant, what December 25, 2021 meant, 
what's happening presently with the election, what those things mean, right? So now, is there anything significant about April 10th, 2024 coming up that we know of? Like, so I'm not saying that we're making a prediction, but is there something that that already is in place in April 10th, 2024? In April 10th, 2020? 2024. Okay, sorry. That it's, bring, it's pointing us to. Now, I don't know, you know, I don't know exactly. I, I'm thinking that if we're going to make some application, it might have something to do with the American election. Is there, I mean, I know there's primaries and all that kind of stuff. Is there primaries that... Um, Go into April. I don't know, right? I'm not sure when. When did when does the American election um, sort of how do, how do they do this? Well, you wind up with a series of primaries. Normally, what you're going to have the first primary used to be in New Hampshire. So, what we're going what we're going to see. In January will be the Iowa caucuses and then the New Hampshire primary. There are several more that come up in February. To answer your question about April, uh, your main primaries in April will be April 2nd, 20 and the 23rd and the 30th. Okay. So, so I've just, I just guessed. I thought maybe it has something to do with the primaries. Now, it's interesting because Iran had pointed out, um, April 8th, we're going to have a solar eclipse. So that's two days previous. Now, um, so it's two days prior to the April 10th date. Yeah. So two days prior, which is interesting. And, and especially interesting because what I was looking at when I was um, looking at this word that's translated as and in those and in those, right? So we have this word hum. Now, we remember that when Strong's does his numbers, when he created his dictionary and he decides a definition of a word and that he's going to give it a number and he's going to tell you where it is. Um, that Strong is not actually a Hebrew scholar. A lot of criticism within a scholarly world is you know, that he gets it wrong many, many times on, on what Hebrew word is actually there. Now, he's basing it upon how the translators translated it uh, more than anything. I'm going to show you here in this other program that I use um, what they say about uh, this verse. So it's, uh, I'm going to show it to you, even though, it, you know, it's just, uh, it's got Hebrew and um, the Septuagint and uh, the King James here. So I'm going to share a different screen. Okay, so this is Scholar's Gateway. Um, this one I use for parsing words, because sometimes you'll look at a word. So, for instance, when you look at this word here, it's going to give you the vowel pointings, va ba'etim. Uh, Abu Etim is how they give the translate, transliteration because they have the vowel pointings in there. So we can see that a little bit clear. Um, you can see like these little dots and uh, these little things underneath. Those are vowel pointings. Okay. Now, when I look at this word, Hachem, they'll show the transliteration there. And the Strong's numbers they give are 1990 and 1991. Okay? So they're going to give, they don't give 1992 for this word here in this verse. So if we were going to use the 1990 number, then we would actually, and we counted from September 11th, an inclusive count, it would bring us to April 8th, 2024. Does that make sense to people? So instead of 1992, which brings us to April 10th, if we use the Strong's number 1990, it would bring us to April 8th. And the word, uh, ham, 
means hot or sunburnt. And it's it's a place where KDL Lamer and, and had this, this battle, right? Uh, it means abundance or clamor or noise, right? So so that's one of the the definitions of of that word. And then it says meaning uncertain. So uh, there's things I don't like about the scholar scholars gateway, um, but that's what they give for that word, right? So they give this these two numbers. They don't give 1992. We did 1990 and 1991. Okay, so if we were going to say, and in those times, and, and it gives us this span of time that goes to either April 10th, the first day of the first month, or it brings us to this solar eclipse, what would that be showing us as a symbol? What is that? What is this symbolizing? What is this connecting us to? On, on its sort of basic way, not, not addressing like the events other than the solar eclipse, what it symbolizes or the first day of the first month symbolizes. So we, we say the king of the south is wokeism, right? right? Correct. Communism. And, and it brings us to, and in those times, and that phrase is either going to bring us to this eclipse, if we use 1990, one, the Hebrew number H1990, I mean, or if we use 1992, it's going to bring us to April 10th. Um, and we have that word for times there, right? So, so in those times, there's so many stand up against the King of the South. So the King of the South being wokeism in these times in which we're li living, do we see that type of standing up against the King of the South occurring? And is that going to continue to occur as we move forward, you know, into April of 2024? Is it pointing us to that as a symbol? And then the eclipse and the first day of the first month, how would that attach to that? Well, first day of the first month, isn't that also pointing us in, into the I mean, the time of the lifting up, the time of the crucifixion. Um, well, I don't know so much about the crucifixion. But the crucifixion is going to be on the 14th day of the first month. But it definitely yeah, but that as you, right? Okay. Uh, right. So it ties us to, uh, you know, the story of Ezra because we got the first days of the first month. It ties us to Millerite history to the first disappointment. It, you know, the, the first day of the first month is pretty comprehensive as a symbol. It gives us 9-11 and 11-9, 2019. Um, so it is a main symbol that we have, right, the first day of the first month. And in relation to time, if you talk about those times, um, definitely it it symbolizes this chronology. Right. That's one of the things the word times does because six, two, five, six, six times two times five times six is three sixty. So we have that, that symbol for chronology and we're, we're placing a date and, and that date can either be April 8th, 2024, when we have a solar eclipse that's going to be, uh, crossing the U.S. Um, and then we have, uh, this, um, uh, first day of the first month symbol. And it's in the context of standing up against the king of the south. Now, now here's another interesting point that not everybody's aware of. But back in uh, 1533 BC, when the Israelites leave Egypt, they're going to leave on the 15th day of the first month, right? And Stephen and I have tried to study and glean um you know, where they're going to travel, how long it's going to take. Stephen and I aren't totally in agreement on everything about uh, But one of the things about 1533 is uh, we're going to have a solar eclipse in Egypt. This is going to occur on March 9th, uh, just about a half an hour before sunset. 
Now, in my chronology, I had marked this as uh, the time in which the Israelites are going to cross the Red Sea. And I place this at um, the Gulf of Aquaba. There's a place in the Gulf of Aquaba that perfectly describes the situation uh, that the Israelites faced. Um, maybe I can bring this up. I'll try to bring that up. So anyway, they're going to cross the Gulf of Aquaba. And um, so in the Bible, when it says the Red Sea, you know, there's a thing we call the Red Sea today. But that's not what the Israelites would call the Red Sea. That They would take these gulfs. There's there's actually two gulfs. There's one Aquaba and the Gulf, um, and the gulf of uh, Suez. So did I say Aquaba before? Yeah, so it's the Gulf of Suez. I said Aquaba, but they're going to cross at the Gulf of Suez. A lot of people place the crossing at the Gulf of Aquaba, but I place it at the Gulf of Suez. So, so there's these two gulfs. And I'm going to share this here. I just have to get to the page. Okay. So when we get to the Exodus here, there's the calendar. Here's what I wanted. Okay. So this is a diagram of uh, the eclipse. So you can see here, this is, this is a map. This is the Gulf of Suez. And this little part here where I have this um, marker, this is where I believe the Israelites crossed. Now, this, I can't get rid of this box because this is part of the picture. But actually, the Israelites would have come um, from up in a place called, um, I can't think of the name. Anyway, it's up in northern Egypt. Um, don't know why the name is, eludes me right now. Okay, so there's no eclipse. This is just a comment in the chat about an, chat about an eclipse at Jesus' crucifixion. There is not an eclipse at Jesus' crucifixion. Um, you can't have an eclipse during a full moon. It's only during a new moon. So this, this, the sun being darkened is not an eclipse. It's not an eclipse of the moon going in front of the sun. Um, and, and it asks about Joel 2. I, I don't, and Acts 2.20. So... Um, I don't know. I don't think that, I mean, eclipses are symbolic in and of themselves because the sun is being blocked out. So we remember in Egypt, they're sun worshipers, right? And this is going to happen at the time of the change in a dynasty. Now, you can see these lines here. So you'll see um, there's this blue line and up above, right? So there's a or purple line, I guess it is. And a purple line down here. These lines, within these lines, you're going to witness a total solar eclipse. The center line is just where the eclipse itself would be uh, the most complete. That is, it's going to be the complete, the longest. This is just the center of that. So it's called the maximum eclipse, right, type of thing. So, so you're going to see that this eclipse is going to occur since 1532, but that's because they have a zero year here. And um, so the maximum eclipse at this point, it says in universal time, it's going to be uh, 4.03 p.m. So that's 16.03, 11.08, right? Um, and that's going to be two hours difference from the local time. So this is going to be about six o'clock. Um, local time that this eclipse occurs okay and the sun's going to set about 6 30 local time so a half an hour before sunset the israelites in my view they're going to come around here up and they're going to enter into this area because it says they go into um i can't think of the wilderness anyway it's it's this area i can't remember what they call it they go in here and then they're going to backtrack and then they're going, the Egyptian army is going to surround them and then they're going to cross the Red Sea and they're going to be back in the area that they were. Let me see if I can find this. Uh, I'll try to find this for you. Because so, I think this is quite an important point. So I'm spending time with it, I'm trying to think of the name of the place. 
So this is going to be in, yeah, so it's in Etham. So this is going to be in Exodus 13. So I'm going to go there just so you understand this uh, history. This uh, what we're referring to here. So they're going to weigh the wilderness of the Red Sea. The children went up, hardest out, hardest out of Egypt. They took the bones of Joseph with them. Right, they're going to have a pillar of cloud, a pillar of cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. Um, so speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pihiroth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Basel Zephon. So the question is, where is this? Okay. Um, and Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land and the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled in the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. Right. He made ready his chariot. So this is going to be this Pharaoh. Um, who's going to flee, pursue the Israelites as they're fleeing Egypt, right? Um, people are going to complain when they're trapped between the mountains and the sea. Fear not, stand still, verse 13, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you this day. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. And the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his host, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh and upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. Right. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camps, camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud of darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these so that one came not near and the other came not near the other all night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all the, that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. It came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth, fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea and the waters returned covered the chariots. So this is the story, of course, the crossing of the Red Sea. So when we look at uh, where they're going to be crossing this Piahiroth and Migdal, right? So if we look at Migdal, I'm going to type it in here. Um, we're going to see it in Numbers 33 as well. That's where I want to go. Okay, so in number 33, uh, it's going to give us the account of the travel of the children of Israel through the wilderness. Um, so Moses wrote their goings um, out according to their journeys by the commandments of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their goings out. They departed from Ramses. Now, uh, that word, their goings out, um, is this word matzah. And it's the going forth of the children of Israel. So the children of Israel, they're going forth. It begins on the 15th day of the first month, but it continues for 40 years, right? Until they enter the promised land. So all those journeys in the wilderness is, are their goings out? 
That's why we count the 400 years from the going out of the children of Israel from Egypt. That's in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. That's why we count it not from when they begin their goings out, but when they complete their goings out. Okay. Um, anyway, that's kind of an aside, but it's an important point. So they depart from Ram Ramesses. That's the place I was thinking of. Um, in the first month, on the 15th day of the first month, on the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. So that's going to be the, the, the 15th day, the morrow after the Passover, right? For the Egyptians buried all their firstborn, which the Lord had smitten among them upon their gods. Also, the Lord executed judgments. And the children of Israel moved from Ramesses and pitched in Sukkoth. So, and then they departed from Sukkoth. So they, now how long this takes, there's this debate, right? Is it three days from the 15th when it talks about the third day? Or is when it talks about that, that it's the third day and you'll see later, um, is that referring from the last time that they had set up camp and then departed from there? So we know that they're going to be traveling on foot, men, women, and children, and, and the animals that they have. And they can only go so fast. So there is this, this argument that it's the Gulf of Aquaba where they cross. And, and that's a long, long distance. For them to get there in two weeks is impossible. Unless you're going to say that God just magically transported them there. The idea is that they actually are walking. And then if you have that they go across the Gulf of Aquaba, it's going to take them another 30 days or so to get a very little distance to Mount Sinai. If we take the traditional position point where they cross at um, um, the Gulf of Suez, then the, the, the journeys that are given of where they travel makes more sense. Okay. So they're going to travel and it says they're going to go to Succoth and then they departed from Succoth and pitched in Etham, which is in the edge of the wilderness. So I'll go back to the map, map in a moment. And they removed from Etham and they turned again. Now that word turned again is that Hebrew word shub, right? That means to turn about. Right. Return. It's translated as return. It's translated as re uh, restore. You know, lots of different ways it's translated, but it, it's this, this common Hebrew word to just turn, to go back. So they went back onto Piahiroth, which is before ba Baal Zephon, and they pitched before Migdal. Right. So Migdal is a tower. Right. And they departed from Piahiroth and passed through the midst of the Sea of the Wilderness and went three days journey in the wilderness of Etham and pitched in Mar. So where were they when they went from Sukkoth? They pitched in Etham, which is on the edge of the wilderness. They're going to turn back and go to Piahiroth. They're going to cross the Red Sea. And where are they going to be back to? They're going to be back to Etham. So the only way that this makes sense is that they're going to, this is the wilderness of Etham on the right side here. You know, this is east of the Gulf of Suez. Over here on the west side, this is where they're going to camp. There's this series of mountains here, really what we would call hills. Uh, but the Egyptian army is going to come up onto these mountains. They can get a view of the camp of Israel and they're going to surround them. Right. So the Israel Israelites can't go back this way to the wilderness of Ethan. They're all here. They're trapped. OK. And then they have to cross here. Now, when you look at the Gulf of Aquaba, it's extremely deep. The Israelites, if you drained the Gulf of Aquaba, uh, it would be nearly impossible to cross it. Right? It, 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 it's not flat in any stretch of the imagination. But here at the top of the Gulf of Suez, and I think I have another map here. I think I have a map. Um, I might not have put it in these notes. Um, let's see it here. 
I think I put it somewhere else. Okay, so it's not in this this series of notes. I do have it other places. But I have a zoomed-in map of the Gulf of Suez. And the water levels there are very low. That is, it's, it's shallow, right? Right here at this point, it's shallow. There's actually a natural land bridge. If you lower the waters a few meters, you can actually, it'll be a land bridge going across this point of the Suez. Now, of course, this was a long, long time ago. We have 3,500 years ago. And um, so 3,500 years ago, things have changed a little bit, but not that much. I mean, you, you might the water levels might have been higher. They might have been lower. Um, this Gulf of Suez, we have now the Suez Canal going north up here to the Mediterranean. Um, so, so there's a, a lot of marshy area up here and so forth. But the idea is that the Israelites now are trapped here. They'd gone into the Etham in the wilderness. They went back to uh, Pihiroth and between Migdal, the tower, which is in the mountains. That's why it's called Migdal, the tower, which would be a lookout tower. They're camped between that tower and the Red Sea. There's enough space here for two million people to camp. Right. And um, it would take them about two weeks to get there. And then they're going to cross. In my estimation, it was going to be on May 9th, um, uh, 1533 B.C. And that's so that's going to be that night on May 10th. They would end up on in the morning on the other side in the wilderness of Ethan. That's how I had calculated but there is this solar eclipse that occurs at this time and it passes basically the center of this eclipse is going right through this, this uh, north portion of the Gulf of Suez. So if they did cross the Gulf of Suez that night and that night, the Egyptian army and Pharaoh uh, uh, Tasekaneri at uh, Kent, pronounce his name. The Pharaoh, who we, who I believe was the Pharaoh who was killed, he's the Pharaoh of the Exodus, uh, because we have a record of this Pharaoh that fits uh, the description. It's not the most common one that people will use because people have a false chronology, right? So if you believe that uh, the chronology was in, uh, or the Exodus was, you know, 40 years later, or if you're going to believe it's like in the, the 14th century or, or in, you know, some people have it even in the, uh, the 12th century. Um, they're going to have, you're going to see all kinds of speculative pharaohs, but this actually describes a pharaohs. And this would also place that the Egyptians are the Hyksos, who um, we have good record of their, uh, the fact that these Canaanite peoples lived and inhabited um, uh, the northern part of Egypt there in the Delta, and that they fled. Now, the Egyptians' count is, is a little bit different than the biblical account as far as reasons they left and so forth. But that's the evidence that we have for uh, the Israelites. So you have to have the Israelites be the Hyksos if you're going to look at um, you know, what used to be believed, right? Now they don't believe that, but that used to be the view that the Hyksos were the Israelites, the shepherd kings. Um, so anyway, that's this eclipse here. So now we're going to say we have this eclipse. It's in Egypt. It's at the time in which I placed the crossing of the Israelites through the Red Sea. What would that mean then in the context of what we have been looking at? in an application to our time. So we have this eclipse coming up, right? So we have a, an eclipse that is being marked in our time with these times. Any thoughts on that? I know there's a long explanation. Is this indicative of a preparatory time? Okay. okay. Explain why you would ask that question. The children of Israel had gone into Egypt, and then when Moses returned to Egypt, it was so that they could, again, understand what it meant to worship God in spirit and in truth, correct? Mm -hmm. Yet they didn't understand how fully to worship. Okay. Now they come out of Egypt 
and they're being led into what they were considering was the wilderness. Okay. Now, if I mean the the way that the way that this would look, the children of Israel were being brought to the area of the Red Sea where they have no way to go forward and turning back with certain death. Mm -hmm. So they had to learn a lesson of faith. So they were being prepared to test their faith. Right? Yeah. So is it possible that these symbols coming into conjunction are to test to continue to test our faith as we're ready to go forward? Okay. Well, I mean, it's clear that God is, is doing this. So the context is then what happened to the children of Israel. We have this experience within this movement presently. So you're trying to make a parallel there because of this eclipse. Okay. Well, I think that's possible. Um, I mean, I think there's more to it than that. Um, so, so I, you know, my mind is obviously on a bit different track as far as this eclipse is concerned. Now, Egypt is the king of the south, right? Agreed. So we can see here that this is, is addressing that symbol in this history with an eclipse. And, and we already say in... Let me see here. So when we get back to Daniel, so I'm just going to share the screen so we can look at what, what I'm talking about again. So in Daniel 11, verse 14, we know that many shall stand up against the king of the south. Right? That's the whole idea of this verse. So this verse brings us to this eclipse in 2024. Now, remember, there was also an eclipse in 2016, right, in August of 2016 in the United States, and this is the one that they talked about next that's going to happen in 2024 on April 8th. There's a bunch of stuff that I studied in the past about the, these eclipses. So the fact this eclipse is coming up and it can connect with this uh, those times, right? So it brings us to this eclipse where many stand up against the king of the south. And the king of the south, of course, is Egypt, right, in, in this literal sense here. And and it's going to be what happens to Egypt. There's going to be a change in dynasty in that time. So Tasakaneri Ra, Re, or Ra is the pharaoh. They, they have his mummy. It's uh, It was decomposed, partly decomposed before it was embalmed and had all kinds of injuries to it. So if, if right. that pharaoh had been the one that perished in the waters of the Red Sea, uh, this would have been the case. You know, they would have to find his body. And then they'd have to bring his body back, uh, you know, to wherever it was, Ramses or whatever the capital was, Thebes or something. And then they would have to embalm him. So and that's kind of rare that you're going to have. Now, they say, well, it must have been battle injuries or something. But, you know, they're speculating on exactly what caused the injuries. And why would he be decomposed, partly decomposed before he's embalmed? Uh, so those are questions that would be really well answered by this. Plus the story connecting with, um, uh, Hippo, uh, um, uh, what's his name? I guess it'd be Apoph, Apophis, Apophis. Um, you know, who's going to be this, this person who's gone for 40 years and shows up to Tasekaneri Ra. And, um, and when he shows up, uh, two weeks before the king dies, his firstborn son is is going to be going to die, so he would have died in in the, with the destroying angel. Two weeks later, he dies, and it's going to be after this uh, this person who we believe to be Moses. Um, yeah, Tasa Canary. So I have to look up this pharaoh. Um, yeah, my other computer has finally started. Believe it or not, so oh. oh. I'll get you, uh, what I'll do is I'll attach a document on academia. It's not my documents. Uh, um, a document by Gerard Gerto. He's an Egyptologist. He used to be a Jehovah's Witness. Um, and he deals with this history. 
of the exodus. And he has the same date for the exodus that I have. And he also notes this eclipse as well and, um, and places it at the time they cross the Red Sea. So, um, so it's kind of interesting that we come up with the same uh, conclusion. So after I had studied my chronology, then, and I had my date, I came across his chronology. Right. So and um, and uh, so when I came across his chronology, like mine was still not perfectly formed, but I had either 1533 or 1532 for the Exodus. And I knew about the eclipse and he points it out as well. It's one of the things that helped me settle on 1533 because uh, it fit in with the timeline that I had for the Israelites leaving Egypt. So we have the king of the south here. So the king of the south in verse 14 being Egypt. And it says in those times. So those times would point us to this period of time that we are presently in. Right. And and we're seeing many stand up against the king of the south. So we're, we're seeing this. And it says also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. So we say that this is the papacy. And would this then be, if we're going to apply this history, let's say at some point in this history, the papacy gets involved. Is that what it's telling us? Or is there something else that we would understand uh, regarding the robbers of thy people here um, as applying to Rome in this history that it applies to our history? Does that um, seem clear to people what, what I'm asking? It's a little difficult to track, but what we're talking, what you're asking, I think, okay. is does this have some greater relationship to what we've been examining regarding the king of the south and the king of the north? Right. So, and this eclipse and right. this election that we're in the midst of and, and all these things that are happening within the movement. And, and symbolically represented with these dates and so forth, that we can now say our application of Daniel 11, verse 14, to this time seems pretty certain, right? That, that we're, not, we're not just speculating, that we have something very solid that ties us to the king of the south, to Egypt. This eclipse that ties us to the Exodus, and remember, we've already used the 1533. Uh, Colin has used it to count from the time when Trump is elected. Now, Trump is elected uh, November 9th, 2016, right? And so we're going to count 1533 days to the inauguration of, of Biden, right? 187 days after July 18. Right. Uh, and, and, and we're going to have that 1346. We can lay, lay it out with the 1533 from Millerite history from 1840 to 1844 that Ellen White says is a, a, a wonderful manifestation of the power of God and refers back to the Exodus in 1533 BC as this, as a parallel. Right. So, so we're taking that 1533 BC, the Exodus. We're taking the 1533 days and we're tying it to this period of time in which we are presently in. And the parallel seems, you know, very solid to me. Maybe I'm suffering from confirmation bias or something, but uh, it seems pretty objectively accurate to place these things together. OK, so this Pharaoh, he has lots of different pronunciations. Uh, Spelling that they give in Wikipedia. So the question is, is it sequinary ta second? This would be the secondary ta. It says that his reign is from 1650 or 1558 to about 1555, right? So that's where they uh, place his reign. And his successor is Kamos. Now, you're going to see various dates when it comes to the Egyptian pharaohs in this period. Um, um, the dates change quite frequently. I've actually seen 
in the past, when I looked at this, it was 1553 that they had for his death, but they seem to change it to 1558. So there's some differences of, of how we place when he lived. So you're going to see lots of different, but yeah, so it's, it's spelled S E Q E N E N R E and then Tao, not Ra, but T A O. Um, so there's lots of different spellings. Um, so he's going to be, uh, this, the last pharaoh basically of the 17th dynasty. Tamos is, is, is his immediate successor, who is technically the last pharaoh, but he's going to be, um, just temporarily there as a placeholder. Now there is a tale, a form of a tale now called the Quarrel of Apophis and Sequinary. So that is the story uh, that appears to parallel this story of Moses. So there's two pharaohs, Apophis and Sequinary Tau, who through the text is not accurate, is, though people don't believe the text is historically accurate. In it, the Hyksos king Apophis challenges Sequinary, the local ruler of Thebes, and with an andinatan puzzle. I don't know what that is. The hippopotami of Thebes disturbs with their cries the sleep of Apophis, who resides in an avarice, right, in the Nile Delta. So that's the area in which uh, Ramesses is, right? So it's avarice. Uh, at the end of the tale has been lost, but Sequinary presumed found a solution, perhaps, to the wise counselor. So, so if you looked into this tale of the quarrel of Apophis, and so the idea is that Apophis is actually Moses, because he's going to be gone for 40 years. And, and so technically in this story, Apophis is, is Moses, that Moses was a pharaoh. He's the son of a pharaoh. So he's a pharaoh, right? And that he comes back and there's a whole story there connected to this. So anyway, that's, that's addressing this sequinary top. But now when we look at this story here, um, we have these eclipses. So we had an eclipse. Um, it was in August of 2016. That was August 18th, 2016. So this eclipse says uh was a penumbral eclipse lunar eclipse and then we have uh this solar eclipse going to be in uh so I'm just I'm just trying to put the dates in here excuse me here so so we got April 8th and then we're going to go back to 2016 and it's going to be August 18th I used to remember how many days apart they were, but um, so they're going to be 2,790 days apart. These two eclipses. I don't got all my stuff open here right now. Um, now that the first eclipse, it's going to occur uh, a few months before Trump is elected, right? And then uh, this next eclipse coming up in April, it's going to be. Um, I don't know how many months before whoever else is going to be elected, but it's 2,790 days apart. Now it's 93 prophetic months. So that's the symbol that's attached to this 2,790. If we looked at it as prophetic years, it's 7.75 prophetic years. So that would be um, seven years and 270 days. And then we also have, uh, if we actually put it in actual years and days, it's going to be seven years and 233 and a quarter days, right? So, so any significance in, can we, can we connect this eclipse in 2016 to this eclipse in, uh, 2024? Um, pardon me, I'm getting this eclipse wrong. It's not the one in 2016. It's the one in 2017. August 21st, 2007. I knew there was something wrong. Okay, so we do have an eclipse, in, but that's a penumbral eclipse. And that one's not the one I was thinking. So it's 
August 21st, 2017. Okay, so this is going to be the first year of of Trump's. Uh, uh, so that's going to be 2,422 days. Now that makes more sense. Okay, so 2,422 days. Obviously, it's going to be less than seven years. If we put it in prophetic years, it's going to be 262 days. So six years, 262 days. Okay, now, uh, so the other point about these eclipses, so here I have this map, and I remember now why I was thinking it was 2016. Um, so there's going to be this place in which these um, eclipses intersect. So I'll show you this once I get Zoom started. So if we say that these times, it, it gives us this September 11th to um, April April 10th or April 8th, pardon me, um, for the eclipse or April 10th when it comes to the first day of the first month. Is this a significant period of time from 2017? And, and that's near the center of that that a structural chiasm, the 777 chiasm, right? Because you're going to have June 22nd as the center, and you're going to have basically two months later is going to be this um, August 21st, 2017 date. <clears throat> well, when you're when you're putting in the June 22nd, that's, yeah. that's been, that has some other interrelation to other points that we've already addressed within biblical history. Yeah, so so this is six years and 262 days, and you can see June 22nd is 622, so you can see that 262 has the same digits. But yeah, so it was part of my structure dealing with the 777 Chias. But I'm not going to go into that right now because we don't have time today. But but the point is, we can connect it with that history within this movement in 2017 to what's happening in the movement in 2024. So, I mean, it's seven years later, not, not to the day. It's six years, 262 days apart from these two. Um, but it's significant, right, if we're going to uh, place it uh, together. Yeah, there would be some significance. It's just a question for us to, to puzzle out, isn't it? Yeah, well, we know we have the symbol of the King of the South. We, we've tied in the 1533. We can tie that to Trump being elected and Biden being elected. We can tie it to uh, this period that we're in right now with these eclipses. So, so we're tying together 2016 and 2024 with these eclipses. And then, i just hang on a sec here. So my other computers, the Zoom is going to start theoretically. But I'm going to show you this map that I have. So this map shows where these eclipses overlap. Let's look at it that way. So it's kind of an interesting map. So this line here in the center is the center of the eclipse. And you can see this is 2017 and 2024. And the square miles, it says approximately 8.165 square miles. Right. So that's an approximation. So in this, in this box. Now that's pretty close, you know, to 8.17. If we rounded it up, We'd have a symbol of July 18, right? So it's kind of interesting. Uh, but these are where they cross. Now, as far as the place, it's, um, I don't know if anybody recognizes the names of any of these places. If you would, zoom back in. I didn't get a good look at the names. Yeah, they're, there? Yeah, it's, it, it's coming up very blurry, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see because it's so zoomed in on a map. Um, Right. So they're going to say here, this is another, another, you know, this advertising. So anyway, this is going to be in, I'm just trying to see where the border is there. 
because you got Kentucky, Tennessee. So it's a little bit, it's north of Nashville, right? Um, you got Arkansas over here, Missouri there, Illinois. So I'm not quite sure where that border is. Not Missouri, Missouri. Yeah, I know. I know. I, I, it's just, uh, that was a joke. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, it's going to be in, it looks like it might be in Kentucky. But I don't know this border that well. So people have looked at this and tried to figure out what does that mean? You know, where, where these two cross, right? So we're not the only people sort of interested in, uh, you know, these eclipses. But, but that's, you know, that's one of the things that we've been looking at, trying to understand, uh, what this means, these, this eclipse. Now we have some comments here in the chat that, uh, so the strong east wind, Angela says, there may be a parallel between a strong east wind blowing all night to dry the path through the Red Sea. Yes, so this symbolizes Islam. So that was the other point, intervening uh, versus our enemies and providing um, a deliverance from them for us. Right. So as far as what that means, definitely the east wind represents Islam. Right. It's also going to be part of the plagues. Right that there's going to be this east wind that, that's involved. So we can see how the symbols here at least attach us to this history, that it's not, it, it doesn't appear to be arbitrary, to be connected to this eclipse. But also, it connects us to the first day of the first month. So that that seems significant. So when we look at this uh so we go back to Daniel chapter 11, verse 14. So the question that we still have to answer is about the robbers of thy people and how they are applied. If we say that the king of the south is wokeism, right, in our time, then the robbers of thy people exalting themselves to establish the vision, what would that imply? That there's something that's going to happen in connection with the papacy in regard to the, our history coming up that we haven't considered, right? Now, this wouldn't be time setting, right? That is, we're not, we're not saying that on such and such a date, something's going to happen because it's in those times, right? In these times here that we are in, we see this already. There's many are standing up against wokeism, but also the robbers of their people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. So they don't want to see the king of the south totally destroyed, right? That's why the papacy comes in. But ultimately, they shall fall. So in that history, that's why Rome comes in, right? So we're saying that the papacy would come in if the robbers of thy people are going to refer to Rome. And we're saying that this is Rome is representing the papacy and then it says, so the king of the north shall come up and cast a mount and take the most fenced cities. So we already understand that this is going to be the battle of Paneum. Are we looking for the battle of Paneum in the context of these lines? Not the bigger line, but just it's in the context of our lines. We already have January 6th as a symbol of raphia. So can we say that this is just telling us that in this period of time that we are in, what we saw happen on January 6th is going to be reversed, that the king of the north shall conquer the king of the south in the United States. Is that a reasonable interpretation? It's the interpretation we already have. But is it reasonable based on what we've just discovered about Daniel 11, verse 14? Why, so wouldn't, it, why, wouldn't it, why would it not be reasonable? Yes, right. So it is very reasonable. And so, but it says, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. This is the Sunday law, right? This is the papacy. Here, it's Rome, it's pagan Rome, right? So, But in our history, it's the papacy. That's the way that we've understood it. Pagan Rome is typifying Rome at the end of the world, modern Rome, the papacy. So this is bringing us to Daniel chapter 11, verse 
you know, to the Sunday law, 40 to 45. It's bringing us to that in history. He shall stand in the glorious land, right? So this seems to fit with what we have been studying. It, it was a long roundabout way looking at all these civil wars and then coming back to here to say, yes, it's pointing to a civil war occurring presently that's going to escalate within the United States. And it's going to escalate in connection with these elections, right? That, that's what we're saying. Now, somebody may say that's a type of time setting, but I don't think that contravenes time setting because Ellen White looked at current events in her day and and recognized that things were being set up for a Sunday law, right, in the 1890s. Now, that didn't occur, and, and, but we're dealing with a typical line here as well. We have to keep that in mind. So we're in a typical line. So we're not looking for the actual Sunday law. We're just saying within our line, what happened, Raffi and Paniam, are, are going to, to occur. And it's leading us to this time in which the Sunday law is going to occur, which is still in the future. And that's what Daniel 11, verse 16 is, is telling us. So I think it's it's very reasonable what we've done from my perspective. You know, it's up to those that are studying these things to to see whether they agree. And, and we still can look a little bit more of the eclipses uh, tomorrow and try to pull some of these things together a little more solid. But just taking that phrase in those times gives us these symbols. Gives us the first day of the first month. It gives us the date of the eclipse coming up. And again, we're not predicting that something happens on that date other than the eclipse. But it places us in this period of time in which we are presently in. So I, I think that we have to say that this is pretty solid um, evidence that we get from the Hebrew numbers here because it agrees with what we already understand, the application that we've made. Okay, so unless there's any further comments, we can close in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the study this morning. We ask for your continued help your presence in our lives and that you can continue to teach us. Please be with us throughout this day and bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.